and original. From Story Studio Network. Well, hello, here we go. It's Thursday, 27th day of July. Welcome in. It's now and next. I'm Dave Trafford for Story Studio Network. Lots going on at SSN. Adding new team members, new shows. Getting to launch a whole new fleet of them in the coming months. Some of them are new seasons of previous series. One of them being with the Daily Bread Food Bank. Excited about that. We're, that's in production right now. Talked a little bit about the subject matter yesterday when I was talking to Gerard Kennedy. And if uh, you are from this part of the world in Toronto, probably recognize Gerard's name. He is the uh, former executive director at the Daily Bread Food Bank. Spent about 10 years there. Was the um, lead on that file um, probably till the mid-90s. And then he jumped into provincial politics. Ended up being, among other things, the education minister in this province. And then after that, he went off to Ottawa and sat as a federal MP. And he brought his anti-poverty mission to those two parliaments. Today we're still talking about the need for that. So we'll get into a little bit of that and the outcome and the fallout from yesterday's cabinet announcements. But uh, that show, the 2030 Project, uh, we're doing a, uh, a series that's going to start at the end of August, take you into the fall. So listen for that one. Curious to see how the feds respond to this Canada Disability Act, Disability Benefit Act, I should say. Yeah, the law's there, but as you heard yesterday, Gerard pointing out, yeah, it's okay. yeah, the law's there, but that doesn't mean things are happening overnight. So there's still much work to be done. In case you missed it, go back and put an ear on it. I'd be really curious to hear what you have to think, have to say, and what you think uh, about my conversation with Gerard Kennedy. Okay, so a few things that we want to talk about, and uh, we're, it's, it's uh, Feed Drop Thursday, by the way. We're going to feature another topic of discussion from the next normal, and that is, of course, the first show that we produced here at Story Studio Network. Just over two years ago, it was in circulation. That was our first show. Last count? And we're pushing like more than 40 now. Mm-hmm. So it's been kind of cool. And uh, if it's something that you're interested in, by the way, check me out on social media, threads, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Got a handful there. That's five. At Dave Trafford. I don't know more about what we do. Shoot us an email. Hello at storystudionetwork.com. And we'd be happy to, uh, you know, have a, Aaron calls them discovery calls. You want to know more about what we do? Maybe how you can work with us on your own podcast, your brand's podcast. We're getting some really interesting references, by the way, from around the world. Individuals, organizations, real broad range of people and brands that are realizing the benefit of using this medium to uh, support your brand or your message or your thought leadership or whatever it might be. So hello at storystudionetwork.com and uh, we will get back to you ASAP and we'd be happy to, you know, Make some time and chat with you. Okay, a few things, though, that we want to talk about first before we get to Feed Drop Thursday. 
I can't believe this, but I am actually making time, and I won't call it an appointment, but I'm paying attention to the World Cup. The women are playing over in Australia, New Zealand. That's a challenge because, well, 14, 15-hour time differences puts things in a bit of a jam. But I sat down and I watched the uh, the match yesterday, Ireland and Canada. And uh, I'm not a big soccer fan, not a football fan. I like the sport. I really enjoy the athleticism of it, but I, I don't know enough about it to be, you know, I talk about hockey and I can talk about that, but I really enjoy watching this. And the women here in Canada have led the way in terms of being the, you know, the standard bearer for, uh, you know, a, a, a mark of excellence. They're the Olympic champions. They're defending Olympic champions. So the pressure's on them to do well in this tournament, in the World Cup. Well, right now, it looks like they are a draw away from making it through to the next round. And that's because Nigeria upset Australia. So you've got this log jam at the top of their group. I know if you're not following this, it doesn't make any sense. But I'm really intrigued by all of this. And I love the way they set the tournaments up because a win is three points. Not like in the NHL where there's three points available, but the winner still only gets two. The losers get one. I mean, that's the dumbest fucking thing on the planet. Don't get me started. You could be a, a 500 team in the NHL and never win a game all season. How does that make any sense? Now, on the other hand, I don't like the shootout stuff and soccer deciding this, so play overtime until you drop dead in the playoffs. Hockey got that right. But I'm really I'm 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 paying attention. I'm invested in the uh, the World Cup over there. So the big match, uh, and I might you know kind of just get up early and watch it. Five o'clock Eastern time. It will be Canada versus Australia. Um, a couple things that we uh, touched on yesterday. We talked about the uh, parade of wannabe cabinet ministers. They are all now cabinet ministers because they were sworn in at Rideau Hall. Trudeau uh, shaking things up. He didn't just shuffle the cabinet. He shook it up. A whole lot of faces no longer there anymore. And a bunch of new faces, rookies in the job that are there. And that's all good, right? I mean, I think that's a healthy and a necessary thing to do. And of course, all of this is in anticipation of the upcoming election. So, you know, based on the agreement between the NDP and the liberals, still a year and a half away, but at any point, the prime minister can pull the pin on the minority government and go to the polls and off we go. And of course, the NDP could do the same thing, although they have not shown any any courage in holding the liberal government to account. So unless something really happens for the NDP to stand up and make a mark and defeat this government on a really important issue, I'm thinking that election night conversation, whenever it comes from the podium, Jagmeet Singh is going to stand there and say, I conceded the election to so-and-so, and and shortly after that, I'm going to step down as leader of the NDP. There's no way he should continue leading that party, given the opportunity that he had. I said last week, you know, the mayor of Toronto, Olivia Chow, obviously close ties with the NDP and the NDP leader, Andrea Horvath. We talked about that this week with Laura Babcock. She... Horvath, the mayor of Hamilton, NDP leader here in Ontario, close ties to the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, in Ottawa. Why are these two mayors not joining arms, joining forces, and saying, Singh, we need you to hold Trudeau to account. Do better. you got to do that. 
Toronto's been completely ignored by the 25 MPs we have here, the federal MPs, 23 of whom sit in the caucus for the Liberals. They've done nothing, including Christy Freeland. Now we have the shakeup. And what's going to happen there? So we'll watch that with uh, some level of interest and intrigue as we get closer to the election. But based on what we were talking about yesterday with Gerard Kennedy and the the Canada Disability Benefit Act, well, the minister who was holding the pen on that is no longer holding the pen on that. Carla Qualtro moved from the minister Ministry of Employment, Workforce Development, and Disability Inclusion to sport. Yeah, sport and physical activity or something like that. And she's a, she's a former athlete, so it kind of makes sense and all that is lovely. The question then became, so what happens to this file? Well, it's an interesting thing because you heard that mouthful, right? It was the Ministry of Employment, Workforce Development, and Disability Inclusion. They have actually taken diversity, inclusion, and persons with disabilities as its own standalone portfolio. Kamal Kara is the new minister of this new portfolio, this new ministry. It's specifically on this topic. So those who are paying attention are somewhat hopeful that that is a signal that the liberals now are coalescing behind the Canada Disability Benefit Act And it's on the right track. It's not going to get bogged down in other distractions within the ministry. It has its own ministry. Will they deliver? Let's make them. Let's make them. I thought it was hilarious this morning. I'm listening to local media here in Toronto. Get all exercised and excited. Wow, this is such a good idea. Or what do you think? Is it a good idea? What do you think? Ontario launching audits of six municipalities to look at how housing laws will affect their budgets. Mm -hmm. That's from the CBC this morning. Well, the story is the province wants to audit the books of several key municipalities. Toronto, Peel Region, Mississauga, Caledon, Brampton, and Newmarket. It's kind of redundant. I mean, they're going to do Peel and then the cities within Peel. Anyway, they're doing that. And the whole idea is to see whether or not these municipalities are spending their money wisely when it comes to infrastructure that is required when we build new homes, whether it's condos or houses, etc. And the issue here is the province's decision to eliminate the developer charges. So it meant that when a developer went in and started building housing or condos on a particular piece of property in a given municipality, they had to cough up a certain amount of money to the municipality in order to pay for the new infrastructure that was going to be required. If until now you had only had three-story building or some industrial building on this site, And now you decide that you're going to build three towers and each of them is 20 stories high. It's a completely different pressure on infrastructure, like water pressure, for example. Pumping that water up straight up 20 stories ain't what it's like to have it in a three-story sprawling building. That's important. And that's where that money went in the past. It's disappeared now. It's up to the municipalities to make How do we do that? We've got to have it. The province promised to make them whole. But now the wrinkle is, well, you know, Bonnie Crombie's just a whiner in Mississauga. She should get on board and start building houses. That's paraphrasing what the premier had to say about her when she complained about it. She did so on this show. And she's right. If you're going to build new housing, new communities, you've got to have the infrastructure to support them. And how is it 
that the developer shouldn't be involved in paying for some of that. Well, it makes housing more expensive now. The lack of demand, or sorry, the high demand, the lack of supply is what really makes it more expensive. So shut up, pay up. Well, they're going to go through all this nonsense with an auditor, Ernst & Young, the EY folks, and dip in and see what's going to happen. I'd be curious to know what the audit's going to be on the audit. Because at the end of the day, they'll come back and they'll say, okay, well, this is what's spent, and this is what's owed, and you know, how are they going to reconcile all that? It's nonsense. What I found really funny is that there was media in the city this morning that made this sound like, wow, this has just happened. No, this, this has been going on since last you know, November, people. Pay attention. Jesus, Murphy. You know, <laughs> this has been a story for a while. And you wonder why local media suffers. Well, because local fucking media is not paying attention to what's going on locally. Could we pick up the game a little bit? Still with the Ford government, some interesting numbers and exclusive reporting by uh, Robert Benzie at the uh, Star. He's the Queens Park Bureau chief there. This came out uh, late yesterday. And it, they're, they're looking at polling done by our friend David Coletto at uh, Abacus. And it shows that the conservatives right now, 41% support. That's pretty good. John Wright will tell you you only need 37 for a majority. So 41, that's a big chunk of the seats if they were a whole election today. That compares to 24% for the leaderless liberals. So there's only you know, an opportunity to go up there, but right now that's where it is. 23% for the NDP. That's brutal, right? That's just, considering the opportunity they were handed at this stage, just not working. But here's where the numbers were really interesting. According to David Coletto's numbers, the survey, says the star, found 54% of respondents think Ford's, quote, decisions have been primarily about what's in the best interest of his friends and supporters. That compared to 27% who felt his, quote, decisions have been primarily about what's in the best interest of the people living in Ontario, with 19% unsure. That's going to be a bell that's hard to unring. It goes back to the conversations that we've been having with the Queen's Park team on the Ledger Ontario Politics podcast about the Green Belt. And really, it doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, yes, I understand the environmental issues around it and the farmlands that we need and so on. Whether or not this was necessary to build housing is almost irrelevant now. For 50,000 homes, they created this shitstorm around the green belt. And it's a shitstorm because all of the implications are and all the smoke around the idea that some of these larger developers in the Toronto region were making money hand over fist because somehow they're cozy to Ford and they are, they're all, they all are, but that, you know, they would have, they would have known Kathleen Wynne when she was the premier. That's beside the point. There was one of the companies we talked about it last week that went in and bought up property week that was already in the green belt. It was in the green belt. Couldn't develop it based on the restrictions, current regulations. Bought it up weeks before the limitations and restrictions were lifted. The idea that, that they were going to actually, you know, do this land swap in the green belt. And now it was eligible for development. The land became incredibly more valuable as a result of that. So the Auditor General is looking into this. Now, whether or not the Auditor General is the right one to do it or not, you know, you can play all the process games you want. That's fine. But at this stage, it doesn't matter. There is a perception and a stink out there that's kind of hanging around the air, and it's hanging around Ford. 
And so David Coletto's numbers, 54% of those surveyed, thinks he's making decisions based on what's good for his pals rather than what's good for the rest of the province. David Coletto is going to join us on the show on Monday, and uh, we'll dig a little bit more deeply into some of those attitudes. And also, he's talking about our attitudes towards immigration in this country against the backdrop of what we saw happen last week with the refugee situation here in Toronto. Um, I think it'll be a rather timely conversation to have. All right, it's Feed Drop Thursday. Welcome in, and we are going to feature uh, another episode. We're getting down to the, to the, 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 the final episodes here of The Next Normal. It would be the show that we produced first here at Story Studio Network. And it just talks about the opportunities that came up as a result of what happened with the pandemic. What were the big issues that we kind of tackled? And it's interesting that this should be the one that comes up because in this episode of The Next Normal, we confront ageism, particularly in the workplace. And if you were listening last week, Lisa Taylor, president of Challenge Factory, joins us. And we had a rather, you know, spirited conversation against the backdrop of Bonnie Crombie making ageist accusations against Nate Erskine-Smith, both of them running for the Liberal leadership here in Ontario. And it was a really, I learned a lot just from talking to Lisa. But in this case, yeah, it was top of mind for those who were sitting around the table for the next normal from Story Studio Network. This podcast ponders how we will live in this COVID era. What's on the horizon? What should we expect? Where are the opportunities? We explore the what's next in In the the next next normal. normal. Lisa Taylor, president of Challenge Factory. The reason every decision we go to make is so difficult is because it's laden with moral hazard. We can't actually judge what's good and bad. Dave Hardy, president of Hardy Stevenson and Associates. COVID has really pushed us to think about what healthy cities mean. Sarah Thorne, president and CEO at Decision Partners. We've really acknowledged the recognition and the safety and the caring for each other because we've adopted these new behaviors. Ujwal R. Kulgut, chief anthropologist and CEO at Motive Base. And this is not just because of the pandemic. This is because a lot of us have gained new knowledge. So have we arrived in the next normal yet? I really want to know. By the way, (laughs) (laughs) I'm Erin Trafford. (laughs) I'm Dave Trafford. Yeah. And I think that's an awesome question because every time you turn your head, right? Okay. That was normal three weeks ago and it's not normal now, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to, we're going to get to a point where the kids are all back in the classrooms and is this normal or is this sort of temporary? So it's all of this kind of, yeah, we're on kind of shifting ground here. We are on shifting ground and we're going to dig in today into, I guess that's a really good point to draw on the shifting myth of age and what Mm -hmm. age means in this normal that we're in, especially when we consider the workforce, how it's changing, how it's adapting. I mean, I think the pandemic really highlighted for us the skills gap and the way we were looking at it as an age-based thing. And maybe it's not really that. Well, yeah, and I think you're right. The whole tech side of it, um, personally, it drives me crazy. When a guy my age, somebody I went to school with, says, I don't understand all this computer stuff and the internet. Shut up. (laughs) (laughs) This has been part of our lives since we were in our 30s. There's no excuse for that. But here's what's interesting. Your grandmother is awesome at navigating the internet. She can find her way to and from, orders online, does all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So the idea that somehow somebody in their 70s or their 80s is ill-equipped to be productive in this new technologically based economy or workplace. Um, I think we've shaken that myth to the core. I absolutely do. And just before we hit record on this, I let you know that I had a woman who is 76 years old apply to be in one of my upcoming programs all about Google and SEO. And I had Mm -hmm. no idea how old she was until she told me. And I thought, 
I had to actually check my bias on that because I just assumed that the people who apply for my programs are, you know, under the age of 45. And it's just was not the case. And I was floored. So I think that that sets up today's conversation really, really well. And of course, we're kicking things off with Lisa Taylor and her take on this whole concept of the gray tsunami, which is not a phrase she likes, by the way. No, it makes her grind her teeth, I think. <laughs> right. The gray tsunami, my my least favorite phrase for this uh, very normal and very positive demographic trend that we are living longer. It cast such a negative light into the concept that we have added years of engagement and productivity and relationship building. It makes it seem like it's a disaster that's happening instead of a triumph. And I think it sets the tone for how we think about age and not just those that are aged, um, but all of us who are aging. I mean, we're aging from the minute that we enter this earth. And yet when we talk about age and aging, we tend to just think about the most uh, senior, the oldest within our, our cohort. And I think that it's really important that we come to terms that we are out of date with our own life expectancy. This podcast is all about the next normal, taking a look at the post-COVID world and the shocks that have happened as a result of COVID and how we're moving past that. One of the things that's really important at Challenge Factory and with the organizations that we're working with is to make sure that everyone recognizes before COVID happened, we were in the midst of a demographic-based revolution. The Talent Revolution is a, a book that's focused on workplace change that's being led by demographics. It was published in 2019 before COVID was on the radar. So as we're exiting the crisis, we are resuming an ongoing revolution. And that's because of this outdated notion of what it means to age and how old is quote unquote old. I'll just give a couple of statistics to kind of just frame just some context to frame this discussion. But when the retirement age was set at 65 across North America, it was 1935 and life expectancy was 62 years old. So retirement was brought into workplaces as a palliative program to help people who were already past life expectancy live up to the dictionary definition of retirement, which means to withdraw or to conclude. You retire to bed in the evening. The dictionary definition doesn't say you retire to a party. And so what we've done is we now have an 83 year life expectancy. We're living longer and that's from all kinds of, you know, great advances in medicine, right from infant mortality rates dropping all the way through to medicine that, that keeps us healthy and vibrant all the way through our lives. We're living longer, but our working life expectancy is frozen as if 65 is a finish line. And because of that, all of the talent structures, the way we think about work, when do we feel like it's too late to make a change? We hear 20 year olds that feel like they've set themselves on a path and it's too late for them to make a change. This idea of a gray tsunami sets us up to think that aging is a disaster and that population is a disaster and nothing could be further from the truth. So I think we need to really confront our own age-based assumptions and tackle the myths that we have, whether they're about performance or money or any of the other things that keep us from really recognizing what does it mean to not just have lifelong careers and learning, but long life careers and learning, because that's the shift that we're all living through, COVID or not. Okay, so there's lots in there, and I want to come back to this whole idea of that workplace application that you talk about and, and, and setting a path and whether or not that has been, you know, shaken under our feet. But Sarah Thorne, let me go to you first, because, you know, when we hear what Lisa is talking about, very much of this is not just driven culturally, but it's institutionally ingrained. So, for example, our healthcare system is not prepared, I don't think, necessarily prepared now to deal with an aging population. We look at it, as Lisa says, as a negative, as opposed to saying, how can we adjust our healthcare services to make sure that we get the most out of those who are, you know, 65 plus, who are still have 
plenty to contribute to society. I think that's a really great place to pick up. And as I was thinking about uh, this episode, I was thinking about work that we did a few years ago for the Public Health Agency of Canada. We were doing um, modeling, uh, influence modeling on what influences seniors' emergency preparedness for climate change um, and extreme heat conditions. And this was after the summer when so many people in Europe, particularly France, uh, died of extreme heat. And I was just thinking about it the other day because it's so topical with the extreme heat conditions that we've had in BC in the last few weeks and the number of uh, uh, deaths from heat. So we did this workshop, an expert elicitation workshop, and I usually like to start, make sure we're all on the same page with definitions. And so I just wanted to make sure that we had, you know, we all had a shared understanding of seniors. Well, we ended up spending about two and a half hours talking about seniors and what seniors means. I mean, is seniors some number that's assigned? Um, is it 65? Is it 55? Um, then we get into young seniors, old seniors. We got into this whole thing, and at the end of the day, one of the key learnings for me that came out of the work that we did was that making assumptions that seniors are all vulnerable is absolutely wrong. And one of the things that we've learned and seen in our subsequent work is that seniors, in fact, may be the most resilient in um, times of change, times of uncertainty. What the what determines how seniors can respond are the social determinants of health, not age. So to Lisa's point, you know, we can't pin a number and say this is the age where we need to um, retire or a company I used to work for called it Decelerate, which to me always seemed like um, driving a car into a wall. But, um, you know, we need to think about what are what are the what's the language that we're using? What are what are the assumptions we're making? What are the stereotypes we're putting around seniors? So Ujwal, when we look at that, then let's let's break the mold here. I mean, based on what Lisa and 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 Sarah are saying, how do we break that mold? How do we take ourselves out of our comfort zone and find you know the the path to solution? What is how do we get there? Yeah, I mean, it it all comes down to the meanings around aging itself, right? And, you know, fundamentally, uh, as much as it is changing in the North American circumstance, certainly aging is seen in negative light, primarily associated with, uh, you know, losing one's creativity, losing uh, one's speed and agility, losing the ability to make um, or develop new ideas, start new things, ventures, ideas. It, it, there's a lot of negative uh, meaning associated with aging. And then that, of course, also extends into the world of uh, physical beauty and looks and everything in between. It is also, of course, a feminist issue as well. So I think fundamentally, you know, in order to solve some of these problems, we also need to uh, re-examine. We also need to turn the tide on these meanings that you know, we associate in the Western world with aging. And I compare this, you know, I, I grew up in India. I compare this to Indian culture, for example, where aging is seen as a positive thing, as something that gives you wisdom, as something that is relied upon heavily. Uh, whereas in the North American context, it is seen, you know, almost as if, um, it, you know, it's, it's a, um, it's a, you know, a sort of a curse, so to speak. Uh, and that one has to find all kinds of ways to avoid it, uh, to slow it down, to delay it. So I think fundamentally there's some broader structural uh, issues that you know have to be tackled uh, in order to change some of the perceptions. Dave Hardy, when we talk about what you do as a planner, you're always looking 25, 40 years down the road. What that requires is a good deal of confidence and courage in your discipline. Where that does not necessarily always apply is politically. So what we have heard so far is that here are the things that we want to do, take us out of our comfort zone. But we're going to require a level of courageous leadership to be able to say, not only is there, um, you know, um, value in the wisdom of the elders, but there's an economic effect here of making sure that we do not waste this resource. 
Oh, ab- absolutely. And uh, for example, in context, my last two hires were 75 and 78 years old people, and they're doing a phenomenal job. Um, and they have huge amount of skills. But I, I set that within their context of living in communities and what we really need to do. Um, we haven't done a very good job of building what I call age-friendly communities. And this would include, uh, I call always homes for people. What we need to do is better uh, support and enable those full lives, whether they be work lives or just uh, quality of life as, as people age. The, one of the big problems we have is that uh, the private sector really doesn't build uh, homes for uh, people as they age. Uh, that's it's, it's starting to be addressed now through granny flats and additional suites that being allowed in some cities, but we're way behind the eight ball on this. We just we just have not uh, done the guidelines and thought through how we're going to make sure that these people in their work lives or their non work lives uh, have. Uh, high quality of life as the age. So that's a big problem that really nobody's getting on top of, except for a small few municipalities. So Lisa, let me bring it back to you because, you know, when we talk about the gray tsunami, and I don't know that drives you crazy, but the idea here is that, that this is, you know, this baby boomer generation is what we're talking about that is going to enter this retirement period of their lives. Um, and I look around at what's happened in long-term care. I look around and talk about some of the things that Dave Hardy's just mentioned in terms of being able to age in place, that kind of thing. I got news for you. My sense is that, that this demographic is not going to put up with the standard of care, the standard of living that our grandparents and our parents were prepared to put up with because it's a different mindset for this generation. My sense is that baby boomers and our kids are going to be the ones who are going to have to make this structural change not only in the workplace, but politically and institutionally. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And when Dave was talking about how we're behind the eight ball or slow to change in the way that we're designing our cities, you know, I think that we can take a look at where are we demographically? The great thing about demographic change is everyone ages exactly on time so we can predict it. So we are halfway through the baby boomer population hitting 65. Depending on where you cut the year, most people will agree by 2030 or so, all baby boomers are across that quote unquote finish line. So we're starting to see innovation in the workplace first. And the way that innovation is being cast at the moment is why won't these baby boomers just go? Like they're not leaving when they're (laughs) supposed to leave. They're hanging around forever. And that is a revolutionary act. Baby boomers have had careers that have followed career paths. In the 1970s, a very smart consulting firm came up with the idea that organizations should have career paths and that people should follow them. And baby boomers, for the most of their career, followed career paths because that was the structure. Now they're at the end of life of the career path as according to the institution, and they're hanging on, they're finding other things to do. The fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs in Canada is women age 55 plus. They're innovating, they're finding new ways of doing things. And that revolutionary act of not leaving the workplace is just a precursor to what we're going to see as they move past their 60s and into their 70s and into their 80s. It is a massive population that their entire life has made sure society adjusts to the needs that they have. And they're gonna continue to do that all the way through. Um, So there's no doubt that we're just at the leading edge of seeing change and smart employers are recognizing that the myths, for example, that healthcare costs of older workers is too expensive or that productivity drops, those are myths. And if everybody's wanting to stay around, the companies that figure out how to capitalize on that talent, like what Dave is doing, like what Challenge Factory is doing, they're gonna be in a competitive advantage because the workforce doesn't end at 60 or 65. We have 20 extra years of potential productivity and people are eager to do new things. So it's there's a market dynamic here that will keep us innovating both on the supply and on the demand side as the boomers continue to push the envelope. Dave, I'd like to pick up here because I think Lisa said something that I'd like to just throw on the table. I think it would be wonderful from a policy point of view if we could just get rid of the word career path. I think that it's a very old fashioned idea. 
uh, when I first started working, I can remember um, having to call my dad, who um, was an HR um, guy, worked for Shell for 30 years, and ask him what this ladder was, because I'd had my first performance review, and I was told that they were concerned I was peaking too soon and uh, on the career ladder. And I was, I, I wonder what, whose la- who's ladder was this anyway? Like, where did the ladder come from? I didn't sign up to be on a ladder, especially a ladder that I didn't create myself. And I think that's Lisa's point. I know more people now that are doing incredibly creative, innovative things that they weren't allowed to do when they were on somebody's corporate career ladder. So if we could get rid of the career path and career ladder language and think more holistically about people's life's work, life's passion, what it is they want to invest their life in, how they want to continuously learn and grow, I think that would be a lot more productive. Ujwal, we, you we call to that jump transitioning. In? Oh, sorry. We call that transitioning with purpose. So students transition with purpose into their post-secondary education or into their first jobs. And when you're in your late 20s, you transition with purpose into where you're going to be able to set yourself up to have the family and lifestyle that you're going to want to have. In your 30s and 40s, you transition into transition with purpose into where you're going to find meaning and contribution and to amass wealth and to be able to achieve some of the things that you want to achieve. And then in your 50s and 60s, you transition with purpose into where you want to really put your footprint and leave a legacy, be able to live the legacy for the last 20 years or 15 years of your career. And so I think the concept that it has to follow a path, Sarah, I think you're right. I think that's out of date and most people would feel that. The skill of continuously transitioning with purpose, especially for those that are in their 50s and 60s, and to make that transition with purpose that includes work, work, meaning, and productivity, I think that's the innovative piece that we need to shift our mindsets to, to say that's not the exception. That's actually the rule. That's what everyone's doing. They're just not talking about it. Yeah, I just wanted to add a point to that. You know, culture, unfortunately, there's there's no one factor that changes culture. And uh, ultimately, it becomes a chicken and an egg scenario. You know, we can make policy changes. We can change narratives and employment practices. But people themselves have to change how they think about their careers. They have to change the ideas that they have been born and brought up with. So there's a massive cultural shift that is also necessary because as long as you have people flocking to buy anti-aging products, taking Botox injections, as long as you have people um, asking the question, oh, what's my growth opportunity here? Or saying, hey, I'm 50, I have to make this much money even though I'm switching a career. As long as you have these kinds of narratives also existing, you know, you can change one side of the coin, but the other side uh, needs to change as well for, you know, for us to invent a new currency. So I just also wanted to bring that up because it is unfortunately a chicken and egg scenario and it takes time and, and there is no one way that uh, this is going to change. Dave? Ujwal, I just want to toss in just for one quick example. Never mind even the Botox and some of the other things that you're mentioning, which is so true. We need to stop giving each other ages birthday cards. Like, just think about the birthday cards in the Shoppers Drug Mart and what you give to people you like. Like, exchange age for any other category, and you would never give that to someone you don't like, never mind your loved one. So we need to individually confront this every single day and see, oh, you know what? Actually, that is wildly inappropriate and not actually my experience at all. I'm going to choose a different path. What uh, what I find is that... The need, I also hire folks that are in their 20s and what a dramatic difference between, uh, probably I've got four four people in their 70s right now and my folks in their 20s. Um, in their 20s, it's um, head in the, the, your iPad or your phone. Um, you can look up and talk to your boss occasionally, but that's incidental to being on Facebook with your friends. And, th- and these are people I'm hiring to actually do work. But there's a set of values and a work ethic that's really important in the senior population, I think still needs to kind of trickle down into our, our, our Gen Z, like spelling counts. <laughs> when, you, when you produce something, showing up to work counts. 
you know, uh, talking to your boss and not your friends count. Um, and, and so all these things, I, I think, just aren't filtering down. They, they need to. But that's why, you know, I, I hire people in their 70s. Can I just say a round of the clap for Dave Hardy on this whole idea that, yeah, you know what? It matters that you show up on time for work. Right? Yeah. This, yeah. this idea that, that we were somehow focused culturally on the, the uh, I think, the wrong end of the telescope. Dave, I loved it. He's hiring people in, this, in their 70s. Why? Because they're good at what they do. And he's also hiring people, though, as interns in their 20s, fresh out of school, but at the same time, teaching them the things that will have always been and always will be true, spelling counts, being on time counts, being courteous counts, ethics count. And that's where I think this reevaluation of the skills gap, this reevaluation of the way we're looking at age gets really interesting because it's those people who have the lived and learned experience. And I know that's an overused phrase, but it's those people who inherently understand those things about life and work and productivity. Well, it's because we've all made the mistakes in our career. And so we saw what happened when we didn't, you know, kind of have that guideline to, to, to carry on. But one of the things that, and I, it's interesting you should point that out, you know, the, the value of the experienced worker, we'll say, is one thing. But the introducing the younger crowd into that environment and where there's a demand on punctuality and some kind of guideline or style guides, we would have called it in the newsroom. I can recall the days working in CFRB in the newsroom. I was the news director and we would bring in students every year, paid internships, great jobs. Many of them have gone on to be, you know, some the major broadcasters in this country. They would walk in there with one year left of education at whatever Ryerson University, whatever school that they were attending, all accredited, great spots to learn your journalism. But there was nothing like walking into that room because there was 700 years of experience that they could draw upon, and it was so rich. And so, you know, to Lisa's point, it wasn't just one person who had that awesome experience. It was the collective experience of all of those people all of a sudden really made the boat float, right? And the beauty of it is the 19-year-old that walked in there all eager and excited to learn how to be a great journalist tested us all because the question was how do you do this Mm -hmm. and why do you do it that way Mm -hmm. right so those two things really kind of close the loop and i think it lisa's right we lose sight of, of of the importance of what we know in the workplace the next normal is sponsored by challenge factory shaping the future of work by decision partners our world is a better place when we make better decisions by motive base decoding implicit meaning behind what people talk about and by hardy stevenson and associates planning the cities of the future comments questions or ideas for our hosts feel free to drop us an email at hello at storystudionetwork.com this series is produced for the story studio network by eye contact productions This is SSN.